so my name is David Blank Edelman. I am the technical evangelist at a company called Appsera. If you haven't heard of us, we make software that DevOps love because we allow you to take sort of like any workload you want and toss it up to the public uh, clouds or run it on-prem, and there's a policy engine in the middle that just sets stuff up. But I'm not going to be talking much about Appsera. There will be another mention of them at the very end, but that will be about it, because this is mostly not about that. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about art. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I love Vermeer. For some reason, in, later in life, I decided that this was like an artist I wanted to see. Turns out there are about 32 of them that are uh, available in public display. One of them was ripped off from a gardener nearby. Um, and so I was recently in Amsterdam on holiday with my family, and I went to the Rijksmuseum, which is a beautiful museum, and I looked at this particular painting over here called The Milkmaid, um, and I saw this thing sort of uh, at, at the bottom, and I thought, that is the weirdest thing. I never noticed that detail. I mean, he was like, he's like super prescient, you know, like he's been doing so. So I, so I basically, the nice thing about the Rijksmuseum is you can walk right up to the painting and basically put your nose against it. And I looked very carefully at it, and it looked a lot like a laptop. And I was like, well, wait, the laptop has a display on it. What has it got? So here, if we, if we were to blow it up, it's like a picture of this talk. And I was like, whoa, what is this guy? from the Netherlands doing, talking about, I must make this talk, I must make this talk. But then it was really freaky because I noticed that in the picture of the laptop, in the picture of the laptop was another picture. And, and so I was like, well, what the heck is that? And it turns out that he was incredibly prescient. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know if you've seen that, but really that's not what we're going to talk about. Okay, anyway, so let's, so I have to do a poll. Okay, so how many people in this room now or work with people who take code or automation logic or other stuff like that from their laptop and they eventually run that stuff in production. Raise your hand, please. What are you guys, nuts? Are you just crazy? Are, do you have a screw loose? Uh, are you just cuckoo or more precisely, are you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? I don't get it. I don't understand what you're doing. Okay, I'm not gonna spend the entire time berating you. I'm kind of tempted to do that because there's really a lot there and it's kind of fun just to get on stage and that would be an awesome talk and someday I'll give that talk. But I want to actually talk about why I think this is a bit of a problem. Um, and before I do that, I want to just give sort of a little bit of a shout out. Um, in the very next room to me um, is somebody speaking. Um, I had been thinking about this topic for a long time um, and actually had submitted a talk about this sort of stuff. And then I saw Corey Quinn speak at DevOps Day's Silicon Valley. And uh, he said some stuff that I think added to this talk that was really good. And he pointed out that his stuff comes from uh, Michael Ducey. Um, who is on Twitter. So I just want to give a shout out to you know, other material along these lines. And um, uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys are all here um, versus learning how to negotiate better salary. Come talk to me afterwards. We can maybe, I'll try to give you the tips that I, that I know about. Okay, so let's go back to this. Why is this problematic? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go right to, for the jugular. Okay, I'm just going to hit you with one of the strongest arguments I have. And here's the argument. It is the case that the failure modes between what goes on on your laptop, what you run on your laptop, and what goes on in production, unless you run production out of a bunch of laptops, which I think is possible because, you know, they have a built-in UPS. It's not a bad idea, but, but don't do that. But, but um, the stuff that goes from your laptop to production, the way things fail on your laptop is significantly different. Anybody here has have to debug whatever's going on on your laptop or your spouse's laptop or your grandmother's laptop, and production knows you tend to bring to bear different things. Things fail in different ways. The other thing I want to point out is, is that we very rarely do any sort of load testing about f to find out how things are going to fall over on our laptop. Can you please raise your hand if you do load testing on your laptop? Not from your laptop, but to your other. So there's one person back there, and I will gladly hand you this because you're more awesome than I am, but I have never done that in all my 30 plus years of being, being in, the, in this business. Um, but so, okay, so let me ask you, sir, do you, in fact, try to see what happens when connectivity fails for your, for whatever it is you're building you're going to be doing? Do you um, check what happens if you suddenly can't get to external dependencies, NPM, cough, cough, et cetera? Um, how about uh, external network dependencies? Um, and I'm going to say something, and I'm sorry if that's going to make you kind of twitch, but like DNS? What happens if DNS is a little funky? Do you try this out on your laptop? Because this is what's going to happen to you in production. Um, how about latency, right? Your latency on your laptop to other things on your laptop is phenomenally good, you would hope. 
right? But that's not necessarily the way the world works. And if you're not testing that, then, then where's that? So, and here's another question I have. When things fail in production and you're running around with your hair on fire and you're trying to get things to fix and the way you recover things in production, is it the same way you fix things on your laptop? Or your laptop's like, well, damn it, I'll just reboot it. Right? It's a different process. It's a different method. And here we go. Here's the point where I grab hold of somebody's neck and I start going like this to them. Show me your monitoring. Show me the monitoring that you're doing of the stuff that you're running on your laptop. Right? Can, you, can I see that dashboard right now? Pull out your laptop, show it to me. And the answer is, you're not monitoring what's going on in your laptop. You're not monitoring it the way you would do it in production. And gosh, I hope you're doing it in production. But, but you're not doing it, right? And so what I want to say to you is that the way things work from a failure perspective on your laptop is very different than production. Similarly, um, performance. All sorts of performance characteristics of your laptop are very different than what your servers look like in production. Very different, right? I hope, unless, again, you're running laptops as your servers, which is bad. Um, um, network, CPU, I.O., you name it, they're all going to be pretty different between what is sitting in a rack someplace, even if it's not your rack someplace, and what is sitting on your desk. Um, and so you can tell that because sort of the golden signals of monitoring latency, traffic, error, or saturation, the constraints of your laptop, I would think it's probably likely that your laptop has less memory and CPU than what you're running in production, though maybe not. Maybe you're running it on Raspberry Pis, I don't know. You know, but, but I would say it's different. And for sure, no one can argue with me that the heterogeneity of your production environments, chances are, does anybody here have a, a, have a production environment that has a single machine, a single machine type, a single OS with the exact same, con exact same components, um, and you know this for sure? Like nobody, right? Oh, one, one, awesome. How is, how is that one machine you're running right now? There you go. So my point is, is that the, prob the probability is very high that the heterogeneity of your production environment is very different, and yet one laptop, right? Okay, the other thing is, is in this now new production world, it's pretty safe to say that modern production workloads are scheduled and they're orchestrated. It isn't the case necessarily to go, well, where is, where, is the data, you know, where, where is the app living? Well, it's over here on this machine over here. Now in modern days, it's in a container somewhere in some, some place, and you don't necessarily know where it is, but on a laptop, you're like, well, it's on one of my three VMs. It's pretty easy, it's that one. Um, and I put this in because I thought it was poetic when I was making it, I'm not quite sure what it means, but it has something to do with the next one, this fi finding the firefly in the fog. Isn't that really poetic? Don't you like that? Um, but I'm, what I'm talking about is service discovery and uh, coordination, right? So in production, chances are you have some sort of service discovery mechanism or some way for the database to be found by the applications. You know, there's some sort of stuff like that. And you're probably not running that on your laptop. You might be, but you're probably not. Um, and chances are you are running it on many machines, N plus one or 10 of them or 100 of them, that sort of stuff like that, not the three VMs that you're running on a machine. And I'm going to say the DNS thing again because I just like to watch people twitch. Um, Right? DNS on your laptop, you're probably not messing with the DNS on your laptop, you're probably relying on an external DNS most of the time. Okay, there are other contextual differences, right? And this is the very biggest contextual difference. The networking setup on your laptop is very different than what your networking setup looks like in your production environments or your testing environments or the fact that you have a testing in a stage and a dev environment, that sort of stuff. It's very different. It, there, it, so your application or whatever you're developing that is running in this little network context on your laptop is not going to be running into something running in, that, in, in the same network contact, con, context in production. Um, separate environments was what I was talking about a moment ago. Um, and sometimes you have these situations where the things that run in production have specialness to them. Sometimes you're running on large memory machines. Sometimes you're running on a, on a machine, uh, on a, you, you wind up in production on a machine that has a slightly broken something or other, and it's acting kind of strange. So it's, it's all strange there. I also would say that there's regulatory differences. If you are from the EU, you probably cannot move stuff around willy-nilly in terms of data. You must keep it in, all, in, in one place. There's, there's requirements, or you have a PCI requirement, or uh, you, you're, you're, you have a SOC requirement or stuff like that, those socks. But that was, we were talking about Sarbanes-Oxley, right? See? So, um, so uh, it's different than your laptop where these things don't exist. Okay, now let's talk about this part. And again, this one gentleman in the back might be ahead of us, but I don't know. And I'm not going to pick on you the entire talk. I mean, it's, it's going to be over soon enough anyway. Don't worry about it. Um, how did the software that you are running on your laptop get installed? 
Same way you install stuff in production. You put it there using that same method, you bet, right? We're running the whatever it is you're doing to get it there. And here, let me, make, let me make this even harder for you. Tell me about the last time you upgraded the software. You went from the old version to the new version. Did you do it the same way you do in production? Or do you just like, and then you just brought up the new one, right? Manually, you probably did it manually, right? If you're doing that in production, I'm sorry, but don't do it. So it's kind of different, right? Um, and finally, um, I'm gonna steal something from Corey's talk where he said the nice thing about security is that you know, we all know you can add it later. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, a, it's, it's a thing, if you need it later, you just get, get some. Um, and so what I wanna say is the security and the, the security vulnerabilities and the stuff that goes on your laptop has some connection to the, your production environment, but I think that the threats are different, okay? So, and the, my last thing to say about this as I'm describing the problem per se, is that the mental model is very different. Because here, so when you are developing or doing whatever you're doing, you have this mental model that what's my life like on my laptop and what's life like in production, okay? And somehow you have to like, you have to be like sliding back and forth. And so does that mean that you have something going in the back of your head? You have this little homunculus and you know, going, okay, I know I'm doing it this way on my laptop to test it, but when it gets produ production, it's gonna behave this way or it's gonna have to work this way. And so I'm gonna write in such so that it will be fine there. And if you're always doing that and running that, it's very tiresome and it's wrong, okay? So I'm, I'm laying out the problem here and I may be making you sad. I'm sorry, or maybe you're getting angry, or maybe you're worried I'm not gonna give you the answer to these problems, which is reasonable. And I just wanna point out it's important not to waste any mimes, so I'm gonna do one more. Um, right, it's an old joke. Anyway, mime is a terrible thing to waste. But you might be excited because we're gonna go and talk about at least my best understanding of ways to be addressing this sort of stuff, or to be thinking about this. So I'm gonna start off with the places where I don't think come quite to where you wanna be. There's what I call false hopes and shattered dreams. And the first one is to go back to the future. And to do that, we're gonna do, people use their laptops as a dumb terminal, um, something like this. Let's see what happens. Well, is this gonna do the right thing? I think we're gonna have to mirror. Doop, 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 doop. Come back to me and then we'll mirror you. Yeah, so you know, something like this, right? So, or here, let me make you happy. Let me make you super happy, we'll do this. Okay, so people use their, their, their laptop, right, as just a dumb terminal into, into some copy of their production environment. That works, it totally works, it's expensive but it works and it's not really using what's on your desktop, but, but I think that's a cop out from what we're talking about. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave this alone. Um, everybody remember this with fondness, no? That is top, it's really the, the processes running my laptop, in case you're curious. And I could actually, we could do more fun with that later at some point. Okay, let's go back here, let's, uh, whoops, not automatically. It's this one, uh, wham. Yeah, nope, here, yes. Okay, or you know, you can go back to the days, welcome to the mainframes, where you submit your jobs, you type kubectl or apc whatever or, or whatever and submit your jobs to a production-like environment from your laptop and your laptop gets used as a nice little dumb terminal. It's a way to do it, it works great, I'm not gonna take it away from that, but I think we can be more creative than that. Or you use a dashboard to try to figure out like what's going on in production, you know, like on my laptop I run a, a browser and it shows me Grafana or whatever and I show what's going on and I use my laptop as a way of understanding how my production environment, what I just unleashed into a production-like environment is doing. I don't know, I don't like those. Um, this is the slide that I'm gonna crouch behind the podium because people are going to be angry and people are gonna throw things at me. So when I go back here, don't worry about it, okay? So we talk about local test suites. Sure, you can do local test suites on your laptop, that's fine, but that doesn't really get you what's in production. Here's the part where I go behind here because people in DevOps get very angry when I say this, but I'm gonna go over here, okay? Here I am. Okay, so the other possibility is that you might possibly say, well, what if I have a CI CD pipeline? That solves the problem, right? Um, and here's where I get you angry. I don't think so. 
I don't think there is any magic tube that I can shove something down, that I can shove lead down one side and it poops out gold on the other side, production gold on the other side. Just because you've come up with an awesome gauntlet that is doing its best to make sure that you didn't make mistake this or kind of sort of worked like that and that sort of stuff, doesn't mean necessarily that you have transformed something from the laptop to the production environment. It's a good step. I'm not telling you not to do CICD. I'm for sure telling you to do it. But I'm trying to tell you that it's not solving the problem, in my opinion. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's shoving, if I can push something through a garden hose and it successfully gets out the other side, it doesn't mean it's production ready, in my opinion. Okay, now right about now you get a little sad because um, I am going to be introducing you, I, I wanna make sure that you, don't, you understand what, what I'm not saying, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the inverse. I, I wanna introduce you to what I'm, what I'm calling the Zeno's dichotomy paradox of production. How many people near know what Zeno's dichotomy paradox is? Right, have you seen this? Some, few, good, two, you guys, good education, good classical education. So that's the thing that says, if I wanna to go to the back of that room and fall down those stairs, which are, look pretty treacherous, um, first I have to go halfway there, right? I have to traverse halfway there. And then in order to get the rest of the way, I have to traverse halfway of that. And then in order to get the rest of the way, I have to go half of that. And eventually, you know, you've set up this paradox where I can never really get there. And so what I'm not trying to say in this particular case is that it is the case that production's over here, the laptop's over here, and production's over here, and never can they meet because we have this paradox. But neither was Zeno. Zeno wasn't trying to say, I can't walk to the back of the room. Zeno was trying to say something about the nature of how we think about this. So what do we do to get warmer about this? So one thing that you could do that will help is you can do something like install a local container manager, uh, you know, container management system, right? So you could install Mesos, um, either the, the free version or Mesosphere's, Mesosphere's version. You can install Docker, which 1.12 has more cool stuff in it that will get you closer there, right? Where you can start replicating closer to your production environment. Um, I'm taking uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry's uh, PCF dev off the list because if you go look at their readme, it says that it cannot, uh, that right now it cannot launch containers that can talk to other containers over the network. And I thought, that's not helpful, not very helpful. Um, Kubernetes is awesome, and if you have not seen Minikube, I kind of re recommend it. It's a really lovely way to bring up a Kubernetes uh, a cluster on your laptop super fast, okay? And I'll show you another one later. Now here's sort of an aside. I think the other thing that we can do to get a little bit warmer is we can start to use some visualization tools. And let me just show you two of them for fun. None of them are any, any that I have any commercial, commercial connection to, but I just like them. Let's mirror the display, let's go over here. Nope. So how many people here know what Raft is? Oh good, I love these people. So Raft, if you don't know about it, is, is an algorithm for consensus. It's a, it's a thing that allows you to have a distributed system, one of the, the well-known algorithms, to have a distributed system and allow it so you know that you're always, that, um, that it is the case that they can all coordinate so that you know that there can be, say, a master that you can always write to, and if the master has to change because it dies, they will all reelect. So this is called Raft Scope. And what I like about Raft Scope is if you've ever looked or know anything about the Raft algorithm, it does a super good job of showing you, like, hey, well, S5 happens to be the master in this particular case, um, and here's how they're going off and they're, they're electing a master and stuff like that. It's just a lovely visualization, and I love that. I really dig that. Another visualization that I like a lot is uh, WeaveScope, commercial company called Weave, WeWorks, I think it is. Um, this is a lovely thing. It's kind of hard to see, I realize, because it's kind of gray on gray. But it's a lovely thing that would give you some idea of, of seeing how things are connected to your world. So, for example, you can say, show me, show me all my containers and how they talk to each other, what the network connections are to each other, that sort of stuff. And I think it's kind of cool. Or by image it's running. So, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just cool. So, okay. Back to here. There is a better way to do this, I suspect, but book. So now that wasn't really truly a distraction because I want to introduce you to something that used to be called Spigo and now is called uh, called uh, Simian Viz. And this is meant to be an easy way for you to take and map out what a, a complex infrastructure, bless you, could in fact be like. 
Okay, so you using using really simple language can say, hey, I want to have 14 of these database servers. I want to have this application server, this web tier, this all this sort of stuff. And so you can map out uh, you can map out an infrastructure, and it allows you to sort of allows you to play with fairly complex and detailed infrastructures on your laptop. And then it, then it has the ability to sort of pass messages between the, the individual things. It's kind of cool. Um, here, let me show it to you. So um, I hope this isn't too small. I don't, oops, let me show it to you by actually showing it to you. Will that help? Back to this mirror display. Doop, 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 doop. Here, okay. So here's an example. Uh, that, so this is done by Adrian Cockcroft, who you may know because he was the gentleman who was the chief architect at Netflix when they did all their cool microservice-y go to Amazon stuff. And so he's been recently playing with how do you figure out microservices and look at microservices infrastructures. So this is one of the examples that, that comes along with, with, with Spigo. Um, these things you can't really see or like, uh, so over here is like your, your, your web front end. Here's a load balancer. Um, and uh, here are little PH, PHP, um, PHP nodes. I'm sorry if that makes anybody twitchy. Um, so, so the question was, what if you wanted to come up with a good infrastructure to, that, that would be uh, resilient? It could be in multiple zones that you could shoot part of it. So here's an example. So he, you can move forward on this infrastructure. So you start off like this, and then what we do is, you know, then we set up a situation where we start to do replicated stuff, and then we can bring in like Cassandra. He has a better version of this demo. It's his demo. Um, we split this, and then we can start going even further, right? Where it's even further mesh. We we have we have it there, and then congratulations. We're starting we're starting to make it so that we can rip it apart, and ha, um, you know, we can get it to the point where we can have multiple zones, and then you know, so yeah, here we go. Here's the awesome multiple zone one. Let me see if I can go smaller. Yeah, can you kind of see? these things, it bounces around a lot. But like this is a ca case where like, let's say you really, really, really wanted to scale your infrastructure, what would that take? And so it's an example of how you could, how you could do that. So check it out, it's really kind of cool. Okay. Now, I, here is my closest version, oops. Here's my closest version of my display control panel. Here is my closest version to um, what I think gets us closer to being able to use your laptop to represent a production environment or to work in our laptop as a production environment. So the requirements, I think, to be able to do that are, first off, you have to have on your laptop a, a, a way to make sure that the components that you're using, the workloads, the containers, the whatever you want, are isolated by default. They come up as little dots that have no connections to each other because really, you, if, if they're automatically connected and they all automatically join a network, then you don't have the control of the topology that you need. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, you need strong environment support. You need to be able to represent what happens if I have uh, a dev environment and a test environment and a production environment because you really want to see what happens when somebody uh, says, wait a second, that database server, it's under your desk, you know, which happens, right, where people start to use production stuff from their dev environment. And you really want to be able to have the ability to control that and test what happens when you break that or uh, stuff like that. Um, you need programmable network control. That's the connect the dots thing. You need to be able to control whether things can talk to each other, whether they can get data in from the net, whether they can talk out of that sort of stuff. You need ingress and egress control. Uh, scheduling and orchestration, that's pretty obvious right after we talked about it, that stuff. Um, and here we go with the deployment upgrade support. There should be some way to, on your laptop, do the same upgrade and, and, and development that you do elsewhere. Um, and my assertion is that you need some way of dictating who can talk to what, uh, you know, what, what does the connectivity, what can the workloads contain, where can they live, um, what resources they can consume. And to do that, like, there should be some sort of policy mechanism. Okay, now let's go and see whether or not my theory actually holds, if you have this sort of thing, um, for the problems that we identified. So if I take load testing out of the picture, will you, in a platform sort of on your simulator on your laptop, have the ability to, to, to simulate failure and to deal with the failure stuff? My assertion is, yeah, pretty much you can. Um, now when it comes to performance testing, um, no. I still don't think there is a vi I think we are very far from being able to have a viable way to do real performance testing and modeling on our laptops. I don't think we're there yet. I, and the thing I'm suggesting doesn't help at all with that. Dynamic and distributed, you bet, including DNS, because you can control your own DNS. Uh, contextual differences, yep, the networking, let's take out the special network stuff because that's heterogeneity and you can't do anything much with that. Um, deployments upgrades, you bet. 
Security, okay. You can argue with me about that one. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, that, that if you have an environment that looks a lot like your production environment on your laptop, then the same sort of uh, security stuff comes into play. I mean, it's, a, it's a good argument that I'd love to have with you at later. And how about that mental model thing, where you're having to go between your laptop and your production stuff? My assertion is yes, 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 for sure, okay? Now, it's not the case that, I have, that, that we're gonna be able to do, deal with this dichotomy problem here, but it is the case that now we've fundamentally changed the difference between what your laptop and your production environment looks like, comes there. So, where are we on this topic? I would like to assert that I have given you uh, the problems to think about, the ways to think about things that you're gonna be dealing with when, you, when you're doing this sort of stuff, and maybe I've given you a little bit of ways to, um, to think about it, so maybe you're a little farther along, and maybe later on you'll be there. So I guess the only last thing I wanna say, besides thank you, is if in fact you would like to try what happens if you have a cool platform simulator on your laptop that kinda does this sort of stuff, we have a free thing that you can go for called the Community Edition and Apps Era. I'm not saying it's the only thing, but it's go play with it because it's free. You, know, um, it's at, you can find it at that URL, we'll get you there. You know, come down the rabbit hole with us. Um, you know, get the bottle that says drink me and try it out. Um, and just see, it, see, if it, see if it's a thing that's, inter that's interesting you. And with that, um, I will gladly either take questions or rotten fruit, or et cetera, or simply, uh, we have three minutes before lunch. You guys wanna get a jump on everybody else, the other room? Because an angry mob is a, hung you know, a hungry mob is an angry mob. Okay, well that's the answer to that question. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a blast and I'll be, you know, I'll be around and love to chat with you. Thanks.